యుద్ధంగా వెళ్తాం యజ్ఞాన్ని చూపించింది ఆయన అంటే బదలీ ఇమ్రాన్ హుస్సేన్ ఇట్లీ స్టార్ట్ చేస్తుంది నహ్మదుహు نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل هو الله الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا احد صدق الله العظيم brother chairman brother president brothers and sisters one may be puzzled that a speaker should comment on the topic of the philosophy of gender in Islam with Surah Al-Ikhlas. Say, we Allah is one. Everything else besides Allah are in jazz. Only Allah is one. That's why we start with this. Gender is located in the world of chairs. And so, in Islam, reality is gender-free. Listen to the Qur'an. وَمِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ We built the heavens with our might, giving it a vast expanse, and we stretched the earth beneath it. Gracious is he who spread it out, and all things we created in pairs that you may give thought to it Surah to the Riyadh, the scattering wind verse number 49 now let's over the day, Ra'ad, chapter 13, verse 3. Now let's go to a second part of the world of cares, that which concerns us tonight. وَأَنَّهُ خَلَكَ الزَّوْجَيْنِ الزَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى And Allah created the phenomenon of sex. He created the sexes, the male and the female. How? From a drop, from a drop of ejected sperm, semen. Surah Al-Najm, chapter 63, verse 45. أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنْ يُتْرَكَ السُّنَى أَلَمْ يَكُنُ أُتْفَةً مِنْ مَنْ يُمْنَى ثُمَّ كَانَ عَلَكَةً فَخَلَقَ فَسَوَّى فَجَعَلَ مِنْهُ الزَّوْجَيْنِ ذَكَرُ الْأُنْثَى 
أليس ذلك بقادر على أن يحيي الموتى؟ This humanity for one moment thinks that it will be left to drift aimlessly without purpose. Was it not Allah? Was it not? Was it not that the human being was a drop of ejected semen? And then that human being became al alaq a clot of congealed blood, something clinging to the walls of the womb. And then Allah created, gave it creation and molded it, gave it form. And then Allah made of it the pair, the male and the female, al qiyam Chapter 25, verse 39. And so, in Islam, Allah alone is free from gender. Everything else belongs to the world of tears. And the world of gender is located in the world of tears. And so we say, in simple language, the ontology of gender in Islam, Allah created the male and the female, but Allah is neither male nor female. In the United States, I'm fond of asking my audiences, and they're normally not as serious as the Pakistani audience. They smile sometimes. I'm, I'm fond of asking my audiences, if God is a man, because they believe that Jesus is God, if God is a man, is he not bad news for women? <laughs> if God is a man, then masculinity is divine. That's a recipe for male chauvinism, isn't it? If God is a man, then masculinity is divine. And femininity, femininity will be only human. Christian Europe, with all its cruise missiles and all its sophisticated technology, and its impressive universities which are attracting the cream of the Pakistani youth. Christian Europe and Christian America hold the view that God is a man. That's why they have to have women's liberation out there. Since God is a man, then even at the level of reality, it is the male who defines the female. And that's precisely what they did. In Christian Europe and Christian America, they believed that it was man and not woman who was created in the image of God. And so, woman's liberation, this is discrimination. God can't be just a man. The, the woman in the Roman Catholic faith in the United States have now launched a movement. They say God is both male and female because there's less discrimination there. And now, Islam, where God is neither male nor female. Praise be to Allah, who created both the male and the female, but is neither male nor female. Praise be to Allah, who is neither father nor mother, neither son 
nor daughter. Praise be to Allah, who never appeared in the person of anyone, not in ancient Egypt, and not in Bethlehem, and not in Chicago. Praise be to Allah, who never appeared in the form of anything, not in wood, and not in marble, and not in stone. We are the only people on the face of the earth who believe that. And so there is no ontological gender discrimination in Islam. The male does not define the female. Allah defines the female. And Allah is neither male nor female. This is of great importance. Because everywhere outside of Islam, the landscape is littered with a junkyard of male defining the truth. I'm usually doing it discriminatory. Let us turn from ontology to cosmology. Surah al Nusa, the chapter entitled Woman. And Allah does it in the very first ayah. Ya ayyuha nasi taku rabbakum ulladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida. O mankind, hear your Lord. So what comes after that must be something of more than passing importance. What is it that comes after? Fear your Lord, who created you all from a single self. وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا and from that single self, he created its twain, its mate. We know that that single self is Adam alayhi salam. The Prophet said, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, kullukum min Adam. All of you have come from Adam alayhi salam. We know that that twain who was created, mate who was created, was our mother Eve. And so in Islam, Allah has created all of mankind from a single father and a single mother. Alhamdulillah, I went into the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, and I told them that. Whether some people like it or whether they don't. Since we have all come from the same father and the same mother, should we not live like a family? How then can you say that it is haram for a Jew to lend money on interest to another Jew? But it is permissible to lend money on interest to all the rest of mankind. That's not living like a family. Of course, they didn't like it. They're not going to invite me back to the synagogue again. Allah created us all from one father and one mother. But He created our mother from our father. He created Eve from Adam. And since the one was created from the other, they are inseparable. And they live with an eternal longing to be reunited. Having created them, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then asks them to live in paradise. Uskun anta, he addresses Adam alayhi salam. Uskun anta wa zawjuka al-jannah. You, doesn't say you and your woman. You and the woman. It says you and your wife. Go and live in Jannah. And so they are now living in Jannah. He is a man and she is a woman. And they are married. Allah married them. And they are living in Jannah. Our question tonight is, in what form are they living in Jannah? Is it the biological form? What is biological form? Biological form is that in which you have a body which goes old. You go old. The biological form is that in which you eat and you drink and then you have calls of nature. That's the biological form. The biological form is that in which the woman will have the monthly cycle. In which there will be pregnancy. This is exist in Jannah. Do we therefore have a biological form in Jannah? An old woman took the Sahada in Medina, became a Muslim. But she was worried. Since all my life I was Mushrika. Now as an old woman I have become a Muslim. Is it possible for me as an old woman to go to Jannah? So he asked the Prophet, Can I go to Jannah as an old woman? He said, No. No. He asked, Why not? He said, There are no old women in Jannah. Oh, oh she feels so sad now. <laughs> she wants to eat. Then he smiled, that sweet smile of his. And I often wonder, where has that smile gone? Isn't his smile sunnah? Have we lost the capacity to smile? Or is it only the Sufi Sheikh who has that magnetism about him? Is it only he who remembers how to smile? He smiles. That beautiful smile of his. And he said, Allah will transform you once again into a young girl. Meaning, the body that we will have in Jannah is not a body which ages. It does not grow old. And so we cannot describe it as biological in the sense in which we know biological. It is not a body in which we eat. And of course we will be eating in Jannah. And we drink. And then have calls of nature. It is not a body in which you have the monthly menstrual cycle and you become pregnant. There are no maternity hospitals up there in Jannah. And so, our father Adam alayhi salam and his wife exist in Jannah. They are male and they are female. There is gender, but they do not exist in the biological form. Well then, 
in what form do they exist? Jannah is that which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, nor has it ever entered into the mind of man to conceive of it. And so we would be on the safest ground if we say that they existed in a transcendental form. Transcendental kamatlab? That which transcends normal observation. Transcendental. Or, an easier word if you'll allow me, spiritual form. And so Adam alayhi salam is already a man while being a spiritual being, not yet a biological being. What is the conclusion? The conclusion is, since husband and wife exist as spiritual beings, and already possess gender, the conclusion is that gender in Islam is something which is essentially transcendental, essentially spiritual. The conclusion is that marriage in Islam, because they live as husband and wife, marriage in Islam is something which is essentially spiritual. Now this is important, because today's modern godless European civilization, which arrogantly presumes that it has the authority and the burden of transforming all the rest of the world into little Europe, declares of itself that it has the most advanced model of society and the most advanced thinking concerning the status of man and woman. What have they done in European thought? They locate gender in the material dimension of reality. As we pointed out, I think, in last night's lecture. They do not have any conception of a dimension of reality which exists beyond material reality. Nothing beyond material reality. There is no world beyond this world. There is no reality beyond material reality. And as a consequence, the world of gender exists within the domain of material reality. And so being male and being female is something which is essentially located in the body. For us, being male and being female is something which is essentially located in the spiritual dimension. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then commands Adam alayhi salam, Go ahead, you live here in the garden. Wala taqrabu hadihi shajara. Do not approach this tree. But then shaitan got to work. And Satan seduced them, husband and wife. And they ate of the tree. فَلَمَّا ذَاقَ الشَّجَرَةَ بَدَتْ لَهُمَا سَوْآتُهُمَا When they tasted of the tree, their shame became manifest to them. And then they took the leaves of Jannah and began to cover themselves. Prior to this, they were naked. But in that naked form, where gender existed only as a spiritual entity, there was no sense of shame. When they taste of the tree that Allah told them, don't touch, 
Now for the first time they become conscious of the fact that they are naked and they feel a sense of shame. So they want to cover their private parts and they take the leaves of the trees of Jannah, Aurat. What appears to have happened here is that biological gender is now activated. Previous to this it was only spiritual gender and now biological gender is activated while still they are there in Jannah. Biological gender is activated and perhaps, perhaps, Allah knows that, perhaps it was at that moment that this occurred. Let me tell you what now occurs. Allah says, وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً from that original pair, he has scattered you now, countless men and women. And then he says, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِّي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتَهُمْ وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِّي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَتَهُمْ وأشهد وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَفْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا Your Rabb drew forth from the loins of the children of Adam alayhi salam He drew forth their descendants and He made them testify concerning themselves saying Am I not your Rabb? And every single one of them, even those who have not as yet been born to this world, every single one of them replied, and they said, yes, we do testify. They come what? There, at that time, at the dawn of creation, before they were sent here on earth. And so every single human being is created at that dimension of reality. And then they descend upon the earth. And the process of descent is through the activization of biological gender. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now turns to biological gender. We are now on earth. Biological gender means the male human being with this physical form and the female human being with that physical form coming together. And he says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ الَّذِي Say Allah now! Khabar the very important subject, Allahumma Jalla Jalla. Say Allah, through whom you demand your rights to each other for the biological bond of the male and the female. What are harm? And say Allah in respect of the womb. The womb which bore you and the womb which will bear your children. And so, we have a philosoph philosophy of biological gender now, which is basically for procreation, so that you will have children, so that the human species will multiply. But look at it! A man and a woman coming together now, biologically. And it is not located in the world which is profane. 
No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala locates it in the world which is sacred, biological sex, in the world which is sacred. It is an act of ibadah. And what a beautiful analogy he uses. He uses an analogy because this is a sensitive subject. And he uses an analogy which beautifully describes the life that he wants you to have, the male and the female together. He uses the analogy of the farmer, farming. He says, نِسَاءُكُمْ حَرْثُ لَكُمْ فَأَتُّوا حَرْثَكُمْ أَنَّا شِئْتُمْ وَقَدِّمُوا لِأَنْفُسِكُمْ سُرْتُ بَقَرَةً Your woman are your fields. He speaks to the men, not to the women. Why? Because of the sensitivity of the subject. It's not discriminatory to women. Your woman are your fields. Which farmer in the world there is who does not have respect for the field which he plows? Your women are your fields. Plow your fields in whichever way you wish to. The ayah comes down because the Jews declared that if you plow the field in a particular way, the child will come out with squint eyes. So Allah sends down the answer. He does it with grace. He does it with beauty. He does it with splendor, with an analogy that is so fit and appropriate. Plow your field in whichsoever way you wish. But remember, there must be respect for the field. There must be respect for the instrument with which you plow. There must be respect for the seed which you plant. When there is that respect, then in the act of plowing and in the act of planting, you are sending ahead of you baraka, blessing for you. وَقَدِّمُوا لِأَنْفُسِكُمْ The seed germinates. And from the soil of biological gender, brings forth the blossoms of Iman, a deep battle. An American can't understand it. Listen to the Quran. After you have plowed the seed, you have planted the seed, then one day the menstrual cycle stops and the seed germinates. Abmaban hmm? The seed germinates. Kazarain akhraja chata'a fa'adhara fa'staghlaza fa'stawa ala suq yu'ajibu zurra'a liyagheeza bihimu al-kuffar Like a seed that sends forth its bleed, then makes it strong, and then it becomes thick, and then one day it stands on its own stem. It fills the heart of the farmer with wonder and delight. Rabbana ma khalaqtaha And when your iman grows, when you lie with your wife and your iman grows, the kuffar, they grind their teeth with anger. We are either the Why? Why are the kuffar so angry? When we lie with our wives and our iman grows more. 
It is because they have a philosophy, a philosophy of biological sex, in which biological sex is supposed to destroy sex, not increase sex. For them, a woman has no reality beyond her material reality. And so you approach woman now with something called lust, L-U-S-T. It is born of materialism and it is used for the satisfaction of the lower or the base desires, hawa. And this is why they are so angry. What happens when man approaches woman with love? Let us now turn from cosmology to psychology. The psychology of gender. The question is what happens when lust infects the male-female relationship? The answer is that the male will approach the female or vice versa for the purpose of satisfying his needs. And so he uses her and he abuses her and he exploits her and he degrades her and he destroys her and then he discards her. Why? Because lust transforms the biological need into a thirst. It's kyasa, kyasa, kyasa. It's thirst. And this is a thirst which cannot be quenched. No. You go to her for the satisfaction of your need. And at the end you are still thirsty. And so you go to her in different ways, in different forms, disrespecting her more and more, degrading her more and more, and that is pornography. And at the end of the day, the thirst is still there. In fact, it's grown, grown a little bit more. And then you do like a fellow called Mike, what is his name, Magic Johnson, the basketball player. He had 200 women. He boasted about it. 200 women. And at the end of the day, the thirst is still there. It's driving you nuts, as they say. So what do they do? If women cannot satisfy their thirst, then they turn to men. Homosexuality doesn't have its origins in some mental problem, medical problem. It has that there is a sexual need which cannot be satisfied with women, and so they turn to men. One in every ten Americans has had a sex more homosexual experience. And so now men turn to men. But the thirst is still there. It cannot be satisfied. It's driving them nuts. And so what happens after that? Yes, they turn to children. To the sexual abuse of children. The Australian government had to enact legislation to make it a criminal act for an Australian to go anywhere in the world and sexually abuse a child. Hmm? The sexual abuse of children is proliferating all around. You send your child <laughs> to an American school, you're not sure whether your child is coming home in the evening. Not at all. Why? 
Because if the teacher gets even a wish that there is something hanky-panky going on at home, the teacher must report it. And then the state will take custody of your child. The child is not going back home. A Pakistani father came to me in tears. The child was taken away from him. A little girl, four years of age. The child was not feeling well, was sitting on those toilet bowls. And because it's a Muslim child, he does not use paper. He uses water. They have their cruise missiles and their skyscrapers in Manhattan, but they use paper. We use water to clean ourselves. Sinja. Sahara. So she asked her daddy, please come and help me. So he came and he lifted the container of water and he cleaned his child. And they call that sexual abuse. And they denied him access to his child. Uh, in the first place, the judge wanted to know why do you have to use water? Why can't you use paper? <coughs> the thirst is not quenched, even with the sexual abuse of children. Now they have reached incest, fathers abusing their own daughters. This is love. The Catholic Church has a problem. In an atmosphere saturated with sexual advertisement, it has priests who are supposed to remain celibate. These priests sometimes reach to this supposed to be an archbishop, an old man. And then one day his photograph is there on the front page of the newspaper. It's happening so often, it's sickening now. He's been arrested because he was purchasing by mail. This just happened a few months ago. Pornography in which there is sex with children and the archbishop is caught because the police were packing the mail. Another one is caught because he was sexually abusing a child, a girl. Catholic priest. This is where lust takes you. They get married. And of course, the American way, you must first fall in love before you get married. And when they get married, they pledge eternal love. It costs a lot of money to get married, first place, and then they pledge eternal love. And eternity lasts for six months. <laughs> or maybe a year. But before that, only year. They start marriage with so much love. And every day that passes by, the love goes less and less and less and less. Until one day it's gone. Where did it go? We had so much love for each other. It floated away on some cloud. Lust destroyed it. Lust is destroying marriages. One in every two marriages now ends in a divorce. And they're broken hearts, broken homes. I wept one day when I went in the supermarket to buy a greeting card. And I saw these birthday cards and I saw these Christmas cards. And I saw this little boy over there buying a card. I looked at the section where he was buying cards and that section had cards 
for daddy and his wife and for mommy and her husband and I put myself in the shoes of that little boy and the tears came from my eyes. Broken home, broken heart, broken children and they say they have the most advanced model of a society. And when these broken children grow up as teenagers, even before teenagers, they embrace drugs. Why? To escape from a reality which is too painful. They embrace teenage promiscuity. She is 14 years of age. She has already had two abortions while still at school. Hmm? Why? He needs promiscuity. Is it because of moral depravity? No. It's because these children are looking for love. Love that they did not get at home. Because mommy put them in the daycare center. Because mommy had a job to go to. Mommy neglected them. And daddy neglected them. And they had to stay with granny. And because mommy and daddy were always quarreling and then the divorce took place. And so they never got any love. And now they have to live with a stepfather or a stepmother. And so now in search of love they end up, end up in the arms of another child. And finally they go up to embrace violence, guns, killing even in the classroom. One, it is the external manifestation of an inner rage inside of them. This is the modern age. Now let's turn to the psychology of gender in Islam. That's what they produce. Let's see what we have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah al -Rum, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And amongst his ayat is this. Amongst his signs is this. Amongst the pages of that big book that he wants you to read is this page that he has created for you. Sumharili. He has created for you. From amongst your very selves, he has created your mate. Why? We're no longer in biological gender now. We've gone to psychological. Why? Is it primarily for procreation to have children? No. No. Lisa? that you may come together in a state of sukun. When I speak about sukun in the United States of America, you won't believe it, how the American people are affected. Sukun. What is sukun? Peace. Contentment, tranquility. There are things in life which money cannot buy. Although there are some Manhattan bankers who will dispute that. There are things in life which money cannot buy. Sukoon is one of them. And they don't have sukoon in that advanced progressive model of society. How does sukoon come? Wajala bainakum mawadda. Allah places love between the heart. They had fallen in love. And then they got married. 
and they pledged eternal love for each other and eternity lasted for six months. It was not sacred love. It was secular love. Love, unless it is sacred love, isn't love. Why do we say this? We say this because Islam recognizes that Allah is the God of love. I made mention of this last night. Allah is the God of love. He is Al-Wadud. Since Allah is the God of love, love comes only from Allah. When love comes from Allah, then that is sacred love. Look at her. If she is a virtuous girl in her public life, and if her appearance is pleasing to you, and if she is willing to be married by you, marry her. Don't wait. Marry her. Marry her in Allah's name. And when you marry her in Allah's name, now live with her in a manner which is pleasing to Allah. But, and then Allah will put love in the heart. Or you to our master. When Allah puts this love in the heart, guess what happens? Put her. Every day that passed by, the love grew less and less. It hurt. Every day the sun goes by, the love goes more and more and more and more. Until one day you ask, how much more love is there? We have so much love between us. And then the answer comes, Allah is an infinite being. Allah is infinite in respect of his being and in respect of his attributes. And so love is limited. In order for there to be sukoon, there must be love. When I say this to the American woman, you could see her eyes with tears. When I say to her that the heart without love is like a plant, without water. It will dry up. It will die. Because the American women have hearts which are longing for love. And they're not getting it. Because of the secular model of society. And so Allah places the love in the heart. But not just love. Something else. Love by itself can't do the job. وَجَعْلَ بَيْنَهُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ With love, there must be kindness. Kindness. Over there you have the image of the macho man. Here you have Muhammad صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم. Muhammad صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم who the demon are. But he is kind with his wife. He is affectionate with his wife. He smiles with them. He laughs with them. He plays with them. He runs races with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. What a man! What a man! With love there must be kindness. Rahmah. And when love and kindness come together, now, Allah will give you support. And then one day your wife will say to you, Oh, it will be like music in your ears. She will say to you, I am a happy woman. I am a happy woman. I am happy with my life. Not many American husbands can hear that. Not many husbands in that modern godless world can hear that. Their wives are usually sleeping with some other man. But if we do that, 
then our wives will say, we are happy. This is what Islam produces. Sukun. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to ponder over these things. And so the psychology of gender now pro provides us with marriage in which there is joy, there is splendor, there is the mystery of gender. In fact, you don't have to wait until you die to go to Jannah. You get a piece of Jannah here on earth. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam said, three things have been made dear to me in this world of yours. Salat, khutbu, nisa, aurat. They use that against him. We are proud to follow a prophet who is honored woman. They are dear to him. Ibn Arabi, Sheikh al Ibn Arabi, he takes this hadith and he explains an ayah of Allah is a symbol. إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب They are symbols. A symbol is something which represents something else. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a creation full of symbols. Why has he done that? Hadith al-Qudsi that Maulana Mazhar Nadri quoted this morning when we were walking. Kuntu kanzan makhfiya fa ahbabtu an u'rafa fa khalaktu al-khalq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I was a hidden treasure and I wish that I should be known. And so I created creation. Namely, that in the examination of Allah's creation, in studying it, in penetrating it, we get the knowledge of Allah. And so we have to penetrate the ayat of Allah to get the knowledge of Allah. Which of the ayat of Allah is closest to me as a man? Is it the bird? or the mountain, or woman. Ibn Arabi says the woman is closer to you as an ayah than the bird or the mountain. And so she is your closest road to knowledge of Allah. And so in approaching your wife now, you are in fact making an effort to approach your Lord in terms of getting knowledge of Allah. Let us now turn to the sociology of gender. And it is here that we have the greatest da'wah to do in North America. In order for the male-female relationship to have stability, there must be marriage. And in order for the marriage to succeed, because the woman is biologically equipped for child-bearing and for child-rearing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has relieved her of the responsibility to maintain herself. And he has placed that responsibility on the male. And because she is vulnerable and she is weak, he has placed on the male the responsibility to also protect and guard her. And so, 
men are guardians of women. Men protect them and men maintain them. In order for a man to do the job that Allah has given to him as a husband, a wife must be obedient. Unless he can be obedient, he cannot do his job. And so now you have the Muslim family in which a man guards and protects and maintains his wife and the woman is obedient to her husband and the woman fulfills her basic responsibility first and the man fulfills his basic responsibility first and then you have stability in the family. I go to the American prison once a week. I go first to the men and then I go to the women. When I go to the women's section sometimes and the officer makes the announcement, some of these American women come, some are black women, some are white women. So I ask, are any of you Muslim? They say, no, none of us are Muslim. So I ask, why did you come if you're not Muslim? What is there in Islam that interests you that you should come? Listen to their answers. They say to me, we are attracted to Islam. Because in Islam we see men showing respect for women. Our men don't show respect for us. In Islam we see women dressed in such a way that command respect, the hijab. These are American women talking about Muslim women in hijab. When the Muslim woman is walking on one side of the street of Brooklyn in hijab, not this kind of hijab that you have from your head of government, I'm talking about the real hijab. When the Muslim woman is walking on one side of the street of Brooklyn, the men respect her. When the American woman is walking on the other side of the streets of Brooklyn, she's the target of the men because she's half naked. She invites sexual harassment. No one will put their hand on a Muslim woman. Not, not in Brooklyn, not in Harlem. Why? Because they know, if you put your hand on a Muslim woman, every single man will come after you. Why? <laughs> because the Muslim men put up their women. If you put your hands on your foot on anything else you want on the American woman, you're more likely than not to get away with it. Because nobody is going to bother about her. They no longer consider it their primary obligation to protect their women. And then they say to me, thirdly, we see that the Muslim family is a stable family. Whereas our families are falling apart. That's the sociology of gender in Islam where men and women come together in marriage as Allah has ordained and where men have kawwam over women. Now let us end. We started with ontology, we went to cosmology, we went to biology, biology, to psychology, to sociology. We had a long journey tonight. But all of this must now be placed in context. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam spoke about a truly evil age which will come upon mankind. An age which will be the last stage of history. 
He spoke about the greatest of all evils that mankind will ever witness from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day. The judge. He said that the last target would be women. The last people to go out to Dajjal will be women. And that a man would have to return to his home and tie down his wife, his mother, his sister, his daughter to save them from being seduced by Dajjal. Now let's see. We live today in an age where that godless world is declaring to women saying to her, all through history you have been oppressed and exploited by these male brutes. From the time of Adam and Islam to this day, woman has been oppressed and exploited. We want to give you freedom. And freedom begins with economic independence. No longer must you be dependent on men for your livelihood. Now you leave your homes and go out and work and earn your livelihood. So you'll have economic independence. It doesn't matter. Leave the children in the daycare center. Leave the children with the babysitter. Leave the children with the neighbor. It happens all over the place. Leave the children with granny. Or go out and work. The baby is only one month old. But go out and work. Because you must have economic independence. Alright? If you neglect them when they are children, guess what they're going to do with you when you become old? They're doing it already. They put you in the homes for the aged. And when you go there, you weep. Everybody, old people. Everybody. It is a pathetic sight to see. A junkyard of human beings. Neglected, abandoned. By their children. Why? Because you neglected them when they were children. Mummy went to work. And mummy neglected them. Ask any child whether he'd prefer to have mummy or the daycare center. Mummy or a babysitter. Huh? Mummy or the neighbor. Economic independence. When you're now earning your own income, now he can no longer boss you around. <laughs> so now you have freedom. You don't have to obey him anymore. Now you can go when you want. You can come when you want. No more hijab. Hijab was male domination. Take it off. And they're really taking it off, aren't they? Even in Pakistan. Take off the hijab. And after you take off the hijab, start taking off some more clothing, and some more clothing, and some more clothing, because the clothes was an imposition upon you. Until eventually, over there in Makkah, they used to be going around the Kaaba naked. Naked. So in New Jersey last month, I was delivering a lecture, and I said, Kalwa Aiga. It will come. Women will be naked on the street, on the beaches. And women will be dancing naked on the streets of Manhattan. So some people in the audience were smiling. And I was wondering why should they be smiling? So when the lecture was over, I asked them. They said, Bhai Jan, they're already naked on the street, on the beaches. They are already naked on the beaches. Hmm? It's called the nudist beaches. And the nudist beaches are expanding and expanding and expanding all the time. Hmm? Take it off, says this modern godless age. Take it off. And she's taking it off. Why should men alone be priests and rabbis and imams? 
that's discrimination. And so a woman can now be a priest. And a woman can now be a rabbi. Prepare yourself. Tomorrow a woman will want to deliver the khutbah for Salat al Juma. It has already happened. Yes. Now no more restrictions on the satisfaction of the sexual desire. He can do whatever he wants because he doesn't become pregnant. You can't do whatever you want because you have the danger of pregnancy. That's not justice. It should be barabba. So now the modern godless world gives her the pill. And the pill is the passport to freedom. Now premarital and extramarital sex with all the worries a pregnancy. Now you no longer have to wait on a man to marry you. You can enjoy yourself outside of marriage. Suppose you don't want to marry a man because men are brutes. The modern godless world says, well, you're a woman, you could marry another woman. And it's happening. And they're getting the marriage certificates now. And the priest has to conduct the marriage of one woman with another woman. At the end of the day, the modern godless world tells the woman, when she has become a junkyard, look at where you were, and look at where you are now. We've given you freedom. And then they use that pretty expression, you come a long way, baby. This is the danger we face. Our woman being infected by this. I said it yesterday. If we lose our men, we can still survive. Because women have held the force many times. If we lose our youth, we can still survive. Because we don't have tomorrow, but we still have today to do something about it. But if we lose our women, we've lost everything. And this is the most dangerous attack of all being lost. And you can see all around you in Pakistan that the attack is succeeding. And so of all the subjects that we must attend to, devote our attention to studying, it is this subject. The philosophy of gender in Islam, the role and the status of women in society. One last word. We do not have to reinterpret Islam. The truth which has come from Allah and his messenger is not to be reinterpreted. No. If we have betrayed it in any way, then we must recover it. If we do not do that, then they will destroy us. But if we stand firmly behind Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, then we can be saved. May Allah grant that we may have the wisdom to do that. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيرُ الْعَلِيمُ وَتَبَعَ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم برحمتك يا رحمة الرحيم Mr. Imran Nazar Hussain would like to answer if there are any uh, questions. Yesterday we didn't have any question on the session. We didn't have kept up 12 months for uh, more than one and a half hours and we covered a wide spectrum of uh, ideas and themes. I guess there must be some questions.
If they want to, from lady section also. Yeah, if they want to get up and ask the question, they can also do that. Okay. You don't have to write it alone. Get up and ask the question. Of course, if the sisters have any questions, they can. The question is, a woman should stay at home and take care of her children when they are growing up, they are young. Can a woman leave the home and go out when the children are no longer young? Question. The answer is that a woman must first fulfill her basic duties before she turns to anything else. Hmm? And once she is fulfilling her basic duties, even if the children are young, she is attending to them, and yet she has a machine in a corner of the home, and she is sitting. She has a cottage industry at home, she is at work, but she is fulfilling her basic duties then that can be something that exists, exists alongside her duties as a mother and as a wife. Insofar as leaving the home and going outside is concerned with her husband's consent, yes, she's allowed to do so. She's allowed to have a business of her own, conduct her own business, be a businesswoman, with her husband's consent, he must be satisfied for her security because he's answerable to Allah for that, for her security. However, if she is going to be working, engaged in activity in an atmosphere which is fraught with danger, men and women working alongside each other every day, Shoulders, elbows, bent, hitting each other. Shaitan is certainly going to penetrate that atmosphere. And there are going to be extramarital affairs and premarital affairs, and there are going to be divorces. It happens everywhere. A husband would be a fool to allow his wife to go into such a dangerous environment. It is his job to protect her. And protection is not only protection of the physical body, protection is also protection of integrity. Hmm? So long as he, the husband, is satisfied, he is contented about her security, then she has the right to engage in whatever economic activity she wishes to pursue. <laughs> we said that Allah is the God of love, and so love comes from Allah. It didn't just come, it's flowing from Allah. Hmm? If, however, the context in which the love occurs is one which is not pleasing to Allah, it won't survive. It won't survive. You will end up with a junkyard on your hands. So the better way is marry in Allah's name. Don't wait. Don't delay. He's waiting on you. He needs someone to maintain her. 
He needs someone to guard and protect her. Mary, don't do it. Mary in her last name. And then live with her in a manner pleasing to Allah. If the people are happy with that, Alhamdulillah. If they are not, that truth is just too bad for them. You're not living your life to please the public. You'd be a fool to do that. Live your life to please Allah regardless of the price you have to pay. Now you're a man. Hmm? Once you do that, then Allah will give you what he has to give you. And no money in the world can buy that. Allah will give you love. Yes? Right. Boys should not marry. Men should marry. Give me a moment. Boys should not marry. Men should marry. You're still a boy. If you're very grown up, and you cannot marry without your husband, your parents' consent. No. My father and my mother don't dictate to me marriage. My father and mother can advise me. But I am a man. And I must live as a man. If I do not live as a man, Kashmir will never be free. If I do not live as a man, Palestine will never be free. Allah made me as a man. And men marry. When a man wants to marry, he marries. Father and mother must be respected, yes. Father and mother can advise, but father and mother cannot dictate to you. When you want to marry son, you marry. Marry in Allah's name. Say to your father, say to your mother, I want to marry. One minute, one minute. I want to marry. I'm 21 years of age, I want to marry. 